Hi everyone and you're very welcome to the next episode of the Paving the Way Home podcast and we're delighted to be joined this week by Stephanie McNamara. Stephanie has a very very special story. Stephanie's uncle, Father Tommy Cusack, who was an Irish Columban priest and back in the 1940s, 50s, Stephanie will fill us in on all the details shortly. He was a missionary priest out in uh, Korea and he was martyred for his fate. It's a fascinating story. His cause was put up for uh, beatification and that process is, uh, is ongoing and Stephanie is going to fill us in on that as well. But it's a powerful, powerful story. And first of all, before we begin, Stephanie, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's de- I'm delighted, uh, delighted to have uh, d- to have you on with us because, uh, look, I know you and I have been back and forth uh, a lot over the last uh, month or so, and uh, and look, this is a fascinating story, and absolutely, absolutely delighted to to, to be able to cover it. So, as we begin, Stephanie, um, could you tell us a little bit about, um, say, the background of of, of Father Tommy, uh, like where he was born, grew up, went to school siblings, family, all of that. Right. Well, Tommy was born in Ballycotton, which is a tiny little village in the parish of Liscannor, County Clare. You'd really, you wouldn't find it on a map. There's no signpost, but it's it's a lovely, small little place. His parents were, my grandparents were teaching in the school in Ballycotton, and he was one of six He was the second child in a family of six. He went to school in Ballycotton to his parents, and then he went to St. Mary's in Galway, which was the diocesan college. And from there, he went to Dalgan Park to be a Columban. That's fantastic. And and so what year was that about? He was born in 1910. Yeah. He went to Dalgan in 1928 and was ordained in 1934. That's amazing. And so once he was ordained... Uh, did he stay in Ireland or, or or was he straight away? Was he was did he go abroad? He always, always wanted to go to China. Yeah. And when he did his leave in cert, he was 18 or his whatever you did at that age. And he his mother wrote a letter to Dalgan Park and she said, I have a boy. That always makes me a bit sad. Um, that wants to go to Dalgan Park. And she said, he has his heart set on going to China and nothing we can do will change him. And she said in another letter, then when they accepted him, he said, she said, can we leave accepting this until after Easter? She said when he was home at Christmas, we tried to change him and get him to go to a home mission, but nothing would change him. And she said, we will go and have another go at changing him at Easter. But obviously it didn't work. So he always, as I said, had his heart set on going to China. But what I suppose they didn't know at that point, the Columbans had two missions in China. But things got kind of troublesome out there. And one of the men who was the head of the Columbans said, we better look for another mission. And they decided on Korea. So... In 1933, before Tommy's go, the, the men who were ordained and learned a little bit of Chinese and went off on a boat thinking they were going to China. But when they got to Manila, there was word there for them to that they weren't going to China, they were going to Korea. And there's a guy called Jerry Marnon, Father Jerry Marnon, that was one of those. And he wrote about it and he said we were bewitched bewildered and something else bemused because they had no idea that they were going to be going to korea they didn't know where korea was even so then when tommy was ordained he obviously was sent to korea but looking at the priests that were ordained with him some of them seemed to go to china but he was sent. That's how he ended up in Korea, anyway. That's a that's fascinating because, particularly back then at that era in Ireland, you know, obviously, okay, back then seminaries were were, were quite were quite full, and the priesthood was was very full. But you know, some you you often hear stories of of maybe priests 
um, even certain dioceses being very full here in Ireland, they'd loan their priests out maybe to, you know, to England, the United States, even Canada. But for someone even for so young, had the desire for priesthood and for China and Corey, that was the opposite side of the world. That's absolutely ast astounding, because when you look at what happened afterwards and that it, it just it very much to me now when I was reading the story with all the information you were sending me uh, initially it just what really spoke to me was that gosh this guy really was really hearing the voice of God from so such a young young age and just knew exactly what he wanted as you said and as I read in the um, uh, in, in the information in the text that uh, like that uh, his mother and people were trying to talk him out uh, talk him out of it and, and to stay closer to home but he was adamant that no this is where he was called to and this is where he's going that's um that's that, that's amazing um how, when he ended up in korea then what was li life like for him over there because um like did he obviously he he was only able to communicate back home to his family uh by letter uh and that i'm i'm sure they they were probably few and far between just because of the, the amount of time it, it took to come be, um for, from those places but what was life like for him out there were they were the koreans good to them or were they kind of um were they very standoffish with all these foreigners coming in or how did they react well, Brian, um, Father Jenny Manahan is in Korea. He's a Colombian who has been very good to me with information and everything. And he said that when they went to Korea, that the people were very, very welcoming and very, very good to them. And um, I will admit that one of the things that struck, struck me very forcibly was... Um, one of the first men that went to Korea was a guy called Father Dan McMenamin, right? Yeah. And he went in 1933 and he died in 1937. And after he died at his funeral, a man called Francis Kim wrote this. The priests of St. Columban's mission scattered all over the world and you, his brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, will lament Father McMenamin. We Koreans too lament him and lament him all the more that we cannot comfort you, especially his relatives. His body reared on Irish soil is, is laid to rest on our soil. He has linked our countries in heaven, he will pray unceasingly for our country. His missionary labors have not ceased with his life. When seeking souls, the wild mountains, the difficult paths, the darkness, the burning summer sun, the biting winter wind did not deter him. The faithful tell of his house to house visits in search of the sick and the tepid. Poverty stricken houses or evil conditions made no difference to him. He was the good shepherd. His death has moved us more than a thousand sermons. Like that, our own Korean martyrs, his death has not been in vain. His grave is on the mountain that overlooks Kwangju Church. On resurrection day, his eyes will light first on this place where he labored. He was ours in life. He is ours in death. We will tend his grave. Have no fears about that. Now, when I read that, I thought it was lovely. But what I thought was even more lovely, Brian, when we were in Korea in 2013, um, we, there was a man who was killed in World you No, know, he wasn't killed. He died at the very end of World War II. His name was Father Harry Gillen. And being, you know, I said to um, to Father O'Keefe when I was in Korea, I said, well, it seems to me that poor Harry Gillen has fallen through the cracks because nobody was talking about him. And you see, he wasn't a martyr. He just died. So he looked, Donald looked down at me and he said, every November for the whole month, people from his parish stand at his grave every evening and say the prayers for the dead. And he said, that's how Harry Gillen is remembered. And when my uncle died, a man called Kim Yeon-bae went 
and collected bones belong to the three priests who were killed brought them home at great danger to himself in the middle of the Korean War and kept them in his back garden for 12 years until he could get a grave for them. And that's how, how loved and respected and cherished those men were. And we felt that same love when we were there in 2013. That's astounding because... And I know we'll, 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 we'll get to the circumstances that were going on in Korea at the time of, of his death. But for someone to do that uh, out of pure love for these priests at a time when persecution was was so rife, just goes to show the love these yeah. these local people had for the for the priests. That was that was uh, that was amazing. So. When they were out there then. Even from, say, OK, before the Japanese, before World War Two broke out and the Japanese um, uh, came to, to take over, did they ever have any problems in, uh, among the Koreans uh, regarding the authorities or a bit, the Irish Columbans when they were out there? I think they did because the Japanese were the Japanese were in charge, in control and um, like they didn't have real harassment on a day to day mm. basis, but Things like they would get off a bus or a boat and the Japanese would in, interrogate them and empty their pockets. And Father Owen McPolin wrote about Tommy that this used to really incense him, that, that, that this type of thing was going on. And he said his blood pressure used to go up and his blood used to boil, but he didn't show it on, on an outside way. But then, you see... The Japanese did an awful lot in Korea. They improved communications, they improved roads. And even when the war was on, they didn't seem to me, now I'm only, from what I can figure out, as harsh as we would have thought they would be. Okay, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so Father Thomas, uh, Tommy, as, as you all know him, and the Irish uh, missionaries. So they were in Korea when Japan entered World War II then. Yeah. Um, so ha- when Japan entered World War II, obviously everything heightened, every intentions, everything, I suppose, uh, the war the, or the whole world uh, in general was kind of almost on a knife edge, really wondering uh, what's going to happen next, where is going to be hit next, who's going to join next. Um but particularly for because the Japanese were now entering the war, how did this affect the uh, Tommy and 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 the, the the Irish missionaries out there? The Japanese entered the war on about the seventh of December, and the following day, they rounded up all the Catholic priests. There were twenty-two Columban priests plus Monsignor Quinlan and Monsignor MacPolin, and they put them. They interred them. Is that the word? Put That's them right. In interred, yeah. For for two months, and then they let them go back to their own parishes. And whereas they said you have freedom, they actually didn't have freedom, and they they were confined. The priests. There were two districts of priests or dioceses or whatever areas in of Columbans and the ones I know about are the ones that were down in Kwangju and Mopo because that's where Tommy was okay. and they were confined to the central house there and they did things like digging a garden and sowing crops and found it that you know they couldn't go out they couldn't minister to their people it was slightly different for Tommy because apparently He wasn't in a coastal town. He was 10 miles away and he was on his own there. So when they, the Japanese interviewed uh, the priest in the coastal town and he said that, he said something about Mongolian ponies being going in a boat or something weird like that. And he said he had told Father Cusick. So Tommy was hauled in and Tommy was kept for two months in prison by himself and was interrogated. They thought he was a spy and they questioned him day in, day out. And a, a, 
apparently when all that was over, somebody got those records and I would love to get them. They said the answers were, the Japanese, they had a funny way apparently of questioning people and uh, that Father McPoland again would have said Tommy's answers were superb and said a lot without saying anything kind of thing. I remember reading that actually in the uh, in, in the text and that they said it was it, it was it was as if he was a uh, a skilled negotiator himself because he knew exactly how to give uh, an answer that would protect him and other people but at the same time um, he wasn't giving anything away and it was fascinating just actually a very practical question before we come back to that did father tommy learn when did he learn the local dialect obviously because obviously they had no english out there um and and he and, and i'd imagine there was no korean uh language being spoken or being taught in ireland before he went out so how did how did he learn and how quick did he did he pick it up they had um they they spent the first six months learning korean and excuse me father mike Poland again he, we have a lot of information from him would have said that tommy picked it up very quickly he said korean was a funny language to learn and um that you know you could kind of make a fool of yourself in what you'd say as you could with any language but that, pe- pe- that the only real way to learn it was to go out and to mix with Korean people. And he said, Tommy did that with ease and picked it up fairly quickly. And then when he was interned in Mokpo, he studied it and he became very fluent at Korean. So that, but how the Japanese conversed with him now when when they had him, I couldn't tell you. I just, when you were talking there, that struck me. He surely didn't have any Japanese language. So yeah. they had Korean, I suppose. But that's he, very, that's very true. That's very, very possible. And when he was, when he was imprisoned during the, the two months and he was interrogated, was there ever any talk of any torture or beatings or anything like that? No. And okay. when he came home, the, the things that my mother told us were that he, um, there was drip, drip, drip of water. I, I remember that one. And he said, if any priests were ever brought out for interrogation, the other priests silently anointed them because they didn't know whether they'd come back or not. And when you read now, you, I said no there to you, but I was reading something that it wasn't Father Joseph O'Brien, one of the priests. He trust wasn't Father Joseph O'Brien, I can't think of his name now. And he wrote an article about that a lot of people, lay people, were taken into prison, Catholics, women, and children, and they were tortured. And he said you could hear them crying. Now, Tommy didn't say that in when he came home he also said that they used to save grains of rice uh, in the from their meager food to say mass with it and he said they all came out at very when they were in there when they were okay when tommy was let out then after the two months and he went back to mopo they told him they were taking him to the capital to kill him to, and he, he, they weren't at all. They let him back with the other priest, but apparently he didn't take the joke as in the spirit. But he said that they used to wash their teeth with bacon soda, and they all had very good teeth at the end of the war. That, that you know, she just told us bits like that, and she wouldn't half listen to her anyway, you know. That's that's very interesting. What, what really strikes me there is that as each of the priests, were being let out by, uh, you know, being, uh, being let out to be interrogated. That the other priests would get, issue the last rites. So just, uh, I, I, even just that image alone for me, is astounding. Just even just to see the faith of these men, even under pressure and the severe, severe circumstances, and uh, and here they are caring for the souls of of, of of each other. It's astounding. You, you may not have received this information now or not. I don't know. But during the two months they were in prison, I presume then it was it would have been impossible really for them to uh, to celebrate the Eucharist, celebrate Mass even secretly or of it. 
Well, that's what I was saying to you. They used to keep grains of rice. Oh, that's what the grain. Oh, yes, and, yes, um, yes, yes. Quietly, discreetly celebrate the Eucharist. And doesn't that show, you know, the faith and the importance of God in their lives, you know? That's exactly, like, that was the whole thing that, you know, when I first heard about this story, it was a, a friend of mine, Father uh, John Waters over in uh, England. He was a, uh, I studied with him for a time in Rome and he's now a priest in England. And um, obviously he put, he, he put Pat Flanagan in touch with me, put me in touch with you um, and that. But what was just, just thinking back there, even thinking back to my, like, cause I spent a bit of time in seminary, my time in seminary with John um, and that, and when you think back to these priests, then that even like they suffered, they, and like like Father Tommy, who even at one stage was being told you're being led to your death, even though it was a joke, um, but and they didn't tell him it was a joke. But everything that these priests did were, you know, it was all for the you know for for the glory of God's kingdom, for the salvation of souls, to um, you know just just to help the other person, and it's absolutely powerful powerful witness like i even just thinking of my of my time in uh um in in, in rome in the in the seminary and in, in, in different places that um you know i remember when you'd hear stories like this it would just give you that kind of a that kind of a boost that kind of that desire to say gosh like these there's so many people who've gone before us that have suffered have been martyred have died for the faith and um and that and you know like we're living in a we're living in a, in, in a time today where particularly here in ireland where you know there's not as much uh mass pardon the pun given towards the towards the eucharist a lot of people falling away from the church and that but yet you know when we hear when we like th this father tommy was only a, a generation uh away from fr from yourself and just to the, the witness of these people is absolutely so I can't even put it into proper words it just it, it really really strikes me it's uh, it, it's powerful um so while father tommy obviously when he was uh, in prison he wasn't going to be corresponding uh with anyone on the outside but when he uh was outside of prison how often was he able to correspond to home then in general in life in general when he was in korea um how often would he at home receive letters or whatever from him we haven't a lot of letters from before World War Two, but um, there is two or three. That's all. But I would get the feel from from what I have read and what I know that he was, you know, reasonably as often as he liked, pretty much. But his father died. He went to Korea in 1935, and his father died in 1938. And he wrote a letter back to Maynooth, to Father Bloick, and he said, Dear Father Bloick, um, I got your letter. Thanks for celebrating Mass for my father. I didn't know he had died. He seemed to be in good health when I heard from my mother last month or week or something. And can you imagine, like, the the way we can take up the phone and Skype yeah. or WhatsApp or whatever. And to hear this news that way. Yeah. And that was, thank you. There was no, I should have been told or anything, you know. So I know that he wrote to Granny regularly, even though we don't have those letters. But um, so I don't know. That's astounding. Like you make a very valid point. Remember, um, even last night, uh, there was somebody, uh, a friend in Africa, just in in contact uh, in contact with me, and um, you know there was the other day another pr uh, friend from New Zealand, and you know just there and then we're, we're, we're you're sending texts back and forth, back and forth in a few seconds, and that's what we had today. But back then, when you think of it, like and especially when you're in a foreign land. Um, you look, you're doing the God's work, you're doing the Lord's will, but you're in a foreign land. Oh, your, your, your family and friends and the people you grew up with are on the other side of the world. And particularly when it comes to your parents um, and even not being able to find out from a family member, but from somebody else, it must have been. It just shows the strength of the man when he was out there in his work, didn't com complain because obviously look, he knew himself. There was no other way he was going to be able to find out. 
uh, and that. But there must have been such a heartbreak there to, to find out about the death of his father uh, while he's in the other side of the country and he can't even be with his family at home to mourn. And he just, you know, just just get on with it. And I'm sure he was praying very much for the soul of his father uh, and getting on with the Lord's work. And it's it just, you know, even that is a testament to the strength of character um, uh, of the man. Yeah, um, oh, sorry, Brian. Do you remember I said to you about Dan McMiniman died, and I yeah. read out what Francis Kim, Francis Kim said in that letter. I remember last year when Father McMiniman's mother died, and how he cried as he said mass for him here. So you know, it kind of brought it home to me that probably Tommy felt the same when his dad died. Yeah, you know, didn't say it in the letter, but you know, anyway. Yeah. It, no, it's uh, it, it's very true. And, you know, possibly he was, you know, even at that time as well back then, I know even listening to um, to my like my my own grandfather, who had a massive uh, effect on, 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 on my life. And like he was born in 1918 and just listening to stories as a child that he would tell of his parents, uh, my great grandparents and that. And, you know, even when it came to showing emotions men just didn't do it particularly back then you just kind of you know you kind of kind of sucked it up and and got on with it but what he you know it's 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 um it must have been yeah it must have been heartbreaking um during his time either in prison or um or or, or any time around that was his health ever affected anyway because I'm yeah. sure the reason I asked that is because I'm sure the you know, even the conditions of the prisons out there are probably not um, very very good, really. No, there was never, there never seemed to be an issue. And when World War Two, when they were let out after World War Two, a lot of priests had to come home because they had TB or they were sick. But Tommy stayed, was obviously healthy and was one of the people who stayed on until nine. Christmas 1947, he came home, um, but his health seemed to be fine and obviously was fine when he came home or we'd have heard. Yeah, and that was actually my next question, because uh, I, I was just going to say, like, when he came home, did his family, his family notice any difference in him physically or even psychologically? Or had he changed in any way? Um, you know, like even had he was he more, you know, sometimes you might hear of people that have gone through experiences like this. They might be a bit more reserved in themselves or, or anything. Did, 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 was, was it ever spoken? Did his family ever notice any change? Nobody ever said, but the things we have from when he was at home, you know, um, when he went back, he wrote to my uncle in England and he said, say hello to all the people in Dalg and all the friends that I met there. When he was, he came to Clare, he went back to Bally Cotton, all the neighbours came in and they had a whole big long night and at three o'clock in the morning, they walked the miles down to Liscanor with him to the house where he was staying. And he was talking about meeting other priests. So I think he was grand. I don't know because nobody ever said, but he thoroughly enjoyed that year at home by all accounts. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so that was 1947 when, uh, so when he came home and he was, yeah, he was home then for all of 1948. Okay. And how old was he at that stage? He was born in 1910. So, so he'd been, yeah, in the late thirties, been th- 38, was it? And 38, yeah. So gosh, like I'm only just, and I think that like I'm, I'm 37 now, I'll be 38 in, uh, next April, but, uh, gosh, like he had, Wow, what he what he did um, in, in in the lead up to that. So didn't he, so he returned in in nineteen in nineteen forty eight, and so it was only a couple of years later that he was going to meet his death. Can you tell us uh, about the events leading up to that, from when he uh, when he went back to Korea, l- uh, leading right up to, to that time of his death? Well, when he went back to Korea, he was still down in Mopo. He was a PP down there, or a pastor, I think they call him. And in a lot of his letters now, from there on, he spoke a lot about the church, about the things he was doing, um, you know, conversions, confessions, visits to the island. 
But the thing that struck me the most, Brian, in one of the last letters he wrote to Granny, he said, um, this time last year was a great Christmas. That's the Christmas he was at home for. But he said, I'm so glad to be back. And he said, this is the best life of all. In spite of maybe in a couple of letters before that, there was this thing about, I hate rats. And there was a tank outside the door and rats used to go into it. And he said, this morning I found five dead rats in the tank. In another letter then he said about, you know, going out to the islands for um, mission, you know, visitation and that there would be several hours in a boat. And in one of the letters he said, it was very rough and I thought, we would be overturned and swimming isn't my best thing but he said seven miles of walking after that soon warm me up so there'd be grouses but the overall thing was what he was doing and starting sodalities one of the things he said no i probably shouldn't even say this he spoke about this family of what they used to call tippets now i'm not sure but i think tippets were kind of lapsed catholics a bit and he said they were living here for a few years, but we only just heard about them. And he said one of the one of the daughters was married, but she wasn't married in the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said, I she was in hospital, she was dying, and I went to the hospital last night. I gave her the sacraments. I re regularized her marriage. And he said she died this morning, a lucky girl. And I'm there. How the hell? Could a young married lady that dies be called a lucky girl? And I was over at Mass last February, I suppose, and Father Brendan was saying Mass, and he was talking about somebody, and he said, her faith frames her thinking. And that's when the penny dropped for me, that even if this lady had a family of young children, everything was right with God, and that's all that mattered. And that seemed to be the philosophy through the different things that he would have said about, about, um, you know, his work. And I was just going to say that because there was actually, and you might not realize it or not, but as you're talking from the very start of this interview, there's a theme, there's a, there's a very common theme arising from, as you described Father Tommy and the other priests, it's, um, the salvation of souls um even that story there that you're talking about even when we go back to when they were imprisoned and they're going to be let out to be interrogated and they'd each be given the last rights just in case that they would not be co come back to give each other the last rights and even at the very beginning of of this interview you spoke about um the work that father tommy did going into the poorest of places maybe the dirtiest places wherever there were souls to be to be nourished uh, and to be saved he was doing it and and, and it just goes to show exactly where, where his thinking was, as you describe it there, the lucky girl and people will be going like, how is that lucky? This girl who had her whole life, her family, everything ahead of her. How could you call that lucky? But he said, you know what? It's um, like the spiritual director of Paving the Way Home, Father Patrick Cattle, often says in his, in, in his homilies, you know, we can we can win the whole world and you're going to have the whole world. But if you lose your soul, what's it all for? And and. And and you can see where Father, where Father Tommy's mind was was that once the the person was was right with God and their soul soul is in a state of grace, uh, that's what matters, and that's absolutely astounding. Like it, it it really it is. It's very very touching for for me personally. Just just seeing that desire for for souls and for the love of neighbor, it's absolutely uh, uh, astounding. Um, and so. As we continue, he's getting closer and closer to the events of his death. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. In, he went back in 1949. I don't know exactly what month, but in 1950, the, the war started on the 25th of June. See, Tommy was down in the very bottom part of South Korea. And the war started on the 25th of June and on the 27th of June, Father Tony Collier, who was up in Chunchan, was killed. On the 4th of July, um, Father Jim McGinn was killed. And in August, Father Paddy, Paddy Riley was killed. 
but they, they felt kind of safe down in Mopo. But on the 17th of July, this guy called MacDonald came from the embassy and he said to Monsignor, Monsignor Brennan, who was the main man there, he said, you've got to get your priests out because we can't defend this area. We had, they had to defend Pusan where the port was and they couldn't defend every place. So he said, get them out. So Monsignor Brennan called all his men together and he said, this is what's happening. And he sent Father Henry down to see if they could get a ship from Pusan to bring them over to Japan. And Father Henry came back and he said, yeah, there's a boat going. And Father Monsignor Brennan said, um, you know, you bring the priests and use this car and the other car or whatever, and we'll be fine. And Harold Henry said, are you not coming? And he said, no, I'm staying. It goes with the job. And Tommy said, I'm staying too. And Jack O'Brien said, me too. Now, Jack O'Brien was just there a few months. He was 31 and he was just learning the language. And of all of them, including Tommy, who's my uncle, Jack O'Brien is the one that I think worth fail me when I think of, you know. So those Monsignor Brennan, Jack O'Brien and Tommy stayed. And the following week, the, the communists came to Mopo and they kind of then came to the place and they said, oh, we're not against religious freedom. And the following day or Sunday, and um, they, they went to, the communists came to the church and they asked for a list of the Catholics and Tommy wouldn't give it. And Monsignor, Bre Monsignor Brennan wouldn't give it either. And uh, because obviously they knew what would happen if they did. So that was the 25th of July. And then they were, I, th I don't know anymore until the 4th of August, they were arrested and they were brought to Kwangju jail. Now, Brian, Tommy was a good, well-built man. Monsignor Brennan was a heavy man. And I don't know what Jack was, but two soldiers and those three were all brought on one motorbike. Gosh, and one motorbike. One motorbike. And you know how awful it is, but just try and put the picture into your head of how that worked. So they were in Kwangju jail anyway, and they were questioned in Kwangju jail. And um, they were there and three American soldiers, one of them called Alexander Macaronis, came to the jail where were where, put in jail as well. We were late one night and all the cells were very crowded. And at the last minute, the three of them were pulled out and were put into a cell with Tommy and Monsignor Brennan and Jack O'Brien. And Alexander Macaroon has, has written a few articles about that. And he said that they were, it was pitch dark. And he said they were you know, they had, they'd been captured and recaptured and there were six or and sorry. And he said, this voice said, it's okay, Mac, we'll talk in the morning. And he said, it turned out to be Monsignor Brennan who shared a blanket with him. And he said, Tommy and Jack O'Brien shared their blankets with the other two. And when they woke in the morning, they found themselves with the three priests. And he said that, those three priests did so much to raise their spirits. He said they knew, obviously, that they were going to die, but it didn't seem to bother them. And he talked about one time that Father O'Brien danced a jig and he sang um, Faraway Places. And he said, and we all cried. All six of us cried like babies. And they're the kind of things that break your heart when you hear them. And he said, they heard a bird outside the window. And Monsignor Brennan said, that's the, the voice of hope. And, you know, that comes from the poem, um, Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dixon. So they were there as, now I'm not sure, but 
from my sums of it, they were there a few days only. And then they were all taken, so many of them, 20 something, and they were put in a lorry to go to Seoul. And they were happy enough about that. And on the way to Seoul, on the way, the truck broke down and they had to walk the last seven miles. And they were they were in the truck for three days and three nights now before this. And then on the fourth day, the truck broke down. And as they were walking, there was an attack from Americans and, the, you know, American planes. So they went under a bridge. And Monsignor Brennan fell down the side of it, but Jack O'Brien pulled him up. And then when the attack was over, they went into Tejan. And this Alexander Macaronis and Monsignor Brennan weren't able to keep up. And Tommy had said to them that don't slow down, you'll be shot. But one of the soldiers told them to slow down. And Alexander Macaronis said, I thought this was it, the end. And he said, obviously, Monsignor did too, because you could see his lips move in prayer. But they let them walk. Like, it was unbelievable that they did. They came later than everybody else, and they met up with the priests in the, uh, the, and the other soldiers in the prison. But five of the GIs, including Alexander Macaronis, were taken out, and they were brought to Seoul. And the others were still there. They were left in Kwangju jail until the 24th of September. Now, one of the people who was in a cell with the three priests was a judge's wife. And she was released on the 24th of September. And she said that every time any of the Christians were taken out to be questioned, the three priests got on their knees and prayed for them. And she said, there would be maybe 12 hours on their knees and then they couldn't get up. And, you know, that's more of just the absolute faith that they had, isn't it? it it's unbelievable because like a real test of our faith, you know, when when everything is hunky dory and every, you know, the everything's smelling of roses and the sun is shining and there's no trials and, you know, it's very easy to be practicing your faith and uh, and all that but when your back is to the wall and your life you, you your life is coming towards an end or, it, or or at least it's looking that way um it's a real testament like there's there, there's a no, number of things i'm just gonna go back and just highlight because it really struck to me like obviously the communists came and said they're not against religious freedom but yet they wanted a list of all the Catholics with only one thing in mind. Mm -hmm. So obviously they were using the they're using deceit and lies to try and gain trust uh, so as to get the names that they wanted and I and exterminate them. The other thing is the letter that he sent to his mother mm -hmm. shortly after going back where he said, I am where I am meant to be. And he just like it just really it really struck me that he knew he just really knew true prayer what the will of god was that he was doing the will of god and even though he Pete, everyone else may not have understood it or even agreed with it at the start he knew that this is what god is calling me to be because this is what god is telling me in prayer and god is the one i'm going to follow i'm not going to listen to any other voice i'm going to listen to god's and it's absolutely outstanding and then the fact that even when it, he's be, they're they're being told no we're not going to be able to protect you anymore. Your lives are in danger. Leave the best thing for you to leave. And they said, no, like even knowing, look, by us staying now, this is it is more of a likelihood we're going to die than live. We're going to stay because this is where God wants me to be. This is like, I, I, I can't even put it into words, but as you're, as you're speaking there, it's almost like the hairs are standing in the back of my neck. It's like, this is outstanding. And then when you're talking about the, the prison, they're in the prison and they're raising the hopes uh, of the other men. They're dancing a jig, um, listening to, as, as the Monsignor said, listening to, to the bird outside and saying, that's the voice of hope. There's actually parallels here, for me anyway, to, to the story of St. Maximilian Colby in the prisons in Auschwitz, where, uh, as you now I know um, Father Tommy and his comrades were 
they're in prison for a few days, say Maximilian and Colby is in there a little bit longer with the other people, but they're always praying, always singing hymns, raising the hopes of all the people. Um, and obviously in, in, in Auschwitz, they ended up dying in the, in the prison cell and say Maximilian and Colby, they had, to, they had to end his life in the end with, a, with an injection, but it was the same thing. He was in there raising the hopes of all the people around them, giving praises to God, um, and just trying to bring that bit of hope and joy in the in the in the midst of a, a dire situation, and there's an unbelievable mirror image here to what Father Tommy uh, and 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 the other priests were doing. It's absolutely outstanding. Like and as you said, as you said so many times, it just goes to show where their heart was, where the priority was, who was at the very center of a heart, and it was God. It was God the whole time. They knew what was most important is the salvation of souls and that suffering comes to all of us and you know to some a lot more than than others as as, as these guys uh experience but the the fundamental important thing was that god was number one in the heart and this these guys are just powerful witnesses to that i'm just i'm blown away by the story i really am and you know um two things now that out of context probably one, I was in Australia last year and I went to a church, not a Catholic church, no, it's the Church of Grace. And the man was speaking about St. Paul's letters and exactly what you said about St. Maximilian. Maximilian Colby, yeah. St. Paul's letters. And I always kind of thought, St. Paul, I love St. Luke, I love St. John, but St. Paul... And suddenly I'm thinking, he's talking about Tommy. You know, the letters of encouragement that he wrote from the prison. That, that it, you know, it, it brought that back to me. And the other thing is, the night that they decided to stay, the three of them, he gave a message to a father, Michael, uh, I can't know what's it, Michael, anyway, saying to, to give to Granny. And it said, it breaks my heart to cause you so much pain, but I would never again be happy if I left my people when they needed me the most. And he said, I know that you're proud of me. Wasn't that lovely? That was, that was there, unbelievable. Where it is now, but, you know, it, 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 he knew, I suppose, what was going to happen. Exactly. Like even like I'm even just thinking of the scripture piece where Jesus is telling the disciples before he ascended to heaven, go make disciples of all nations. And uh, gosh, like this is this is certainly what what uh, what these guys were doing. That is uh, that's that, that was outstanding. Um, so so like as we're learning here, like these last like gosh, like since he returned from Ireland, those last two years he returned to Ireland, there was primarily just persecution really that uh, that he experienced and yet in it this is where i want to be because this is where god wants me to be that is that is unbelievable that is such a powerful witness and testimony but brian against not against that but another what really gets me is he was there for 15 years he knew those people he lived with those people but think about jack o'brien yeah 31 years of age yeah six months you know, really only learning the language and that that he stayed, you know, he had no kind of obligation to stay, mm. but he stayed. And that man, when he was ordained, he couldn't go to Korea because World War II was on. So he went to France and he was a chaplain for the British Army in France. And in a letter to some, I don't know who he wrote the letter to, but he said most of his battalion had died. Like he was only 31 and the life he had lived mm. and the witness that he gave to God is yeah. unreal. It is because I'm even as you speak about Jack O'Brien there, you know, what really strikes me there is I've often heard it said, um, heard the story. You know, I, I, I always forget who it's attributed to, but, you know, as someone said, if God was going to come in the morning to say he's going to, you know, that that he's going to your life here on earth is over and he's going to take you. Someone has asked, what would you do? And they said, I just get on doing exactly what I do every day because 
that's my vocation that's what god called me to do so that's what he's going to find me doing and it's just the exact same here with jack Ryan. he he it just seems that he he knew in his heart that this is where god was calling him to be and even though he was only starting out and maybe he might have felt himself look i'm i i'm i'm of no effect to the to the people yet because i don't even know the language yet this is where god was calling him to be he knew that and he knew that from prayer and nothing was going to budge him either because um he just wanted to give his life to where god was calling him and this is the definite this 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 is what the definition of a hero like all of these men are heroes that's what a true hero to to despite the despite what all that they were going to lose and all they were going to suffer to still stand up for love of the people and love of the other it's outstanding and so if we move now to the actual circumstances around their death um and that because i know that you know from our point of view which is a sad point of view that the the bodies were never uh fully recovered is that correct yeah um when the massacre at Tej- <clears throat> excuse me, when the massacre at Tejan took place, there were two main sites. There was the monastery that the communists took over, the Franciscan monastery, and they put what Father Don Lokif describes as political prisoners in there. I think there were Americans and the priests and people like that. And in the jail, which is also in Tejan, they put the Korean prisoners. We met um, Father Kim, Father Pio Kim, and he said his relatives were there. And they they killed between five and seven thousand people in Tejan that weekend. And I think about 600 of those were in the jail and they threw a lot of the bodies into a disused well. Now, when we went out there in 2013... We and, and sorry, this included Father Tommy and the priest, wasn't it? It must have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we went out there, we met Sister Danielle, and she said that some people were alive that were thrown into the well, and she said they pulled out a 12-year-old boy. But after, when the communists left, you know the judge's wife that was in prison with them? Yeah. Herself and her friend, Teresa, went back and they searched through the bodies that were not in the well and they couldn't find Father Tommy or Father Jack O'Brien or Monsignor Brennan's bodies. So the presumption was that they were in the well. And in 1952, when the communists had left the area, the bodies were taken out of the well and they were cremated. But the heat wasn't intense enough and they weren't turned into ash they were all turned into little bones i think you probably have pictures of that there somewhere and um they were buried in a truck on a hill that's where most people in korea are buried all these bones and um in 19 that was 1952 in 1996 that field was being sold so they took the truck of bones and they put them all on a plastic blue sheet and they invited all the relatives of people to come and take bones uh, to, obviously it was you weren't getting exactly your own relatives bones but that didn't matter because like Tommy said they all died together they were all the people together and I think that's lovely that they were all together in death like they were. So this man called Kim Yon Bay came and he took three little containers of bones. He said to the relatives, he said there were three Catholic priests killed and he took them and he brought them home and he set up a little shrine in his garden. And he kept those bones there for 12 years. He asked the Diocese of Guangzhou to take them. I think three times and they wouldn't take them. So the Diocese of Tejan eventually took them in 2008 and they buried the three containers in a lovely grave with a lovely headstone in their seminary, in the cemetery, in their seminary. So um, to go back 
My granny, Tommy's mother and family, heard about his death by a telegram. Now, when they were missing in Korea, every night, no, when they were when they were take when they were taken in World War Two, not World War Two, sorry, in the Korean War, when they were missing in the Korean War, the radio used to give names at night of priests who were missing. And Granny used to listen to it, obviously. And that's how they heard they were missing. And then they got the telegram to say Tommy was dead. And for the rest of their lives, my granny, my mom, her brothers, sisters, they just lived with, they were killed in Taejan and their bodies were thrown into a disused well and they were never found. No, that's a very hard thing to live with. And it's one of my few regrets that they didn't get the story. The well was dug up and they were buried in a grave. That would have meant so much to my grandmother or to my mother to know my mother was alive when that happened my grandmother was alive when that happened but you know it would have comforted them so much to know that and the other thing that when we were young we were kids and we'd be down at our granny's or she'd be up at our house every single night when the news would come on we'd have to wait because she used to listen in case she heard that any of her other children were missing now i forgot to say during world war ii she had another son who was blown up in a ship and his body was never found but it never struck us as children, obviously, but later in the last few years, I began to think she must have been so traumatized that, that, that she would listen to this news every night just to see if any of the four that were left were missing. And I think that's unbelievably sad. Exactly, because it's, you know, even even just to think of it, first of all, to when you have two two children that were that were killed and... <clears throat> just knowing they don't have there's no final resting place for for the living to go and pay their respects but also to be just to be almost you know sitting on the edge of your seat almost praying that look I don't want to hear their names mentioned over the radio or you know it, it that must have been and for that to go on over such a long time that must have been quite traumatic and distressing for her that's uh, it's very sad so that's pretty much it, I think, is it? And and just um just this was the the, the final the, the final thing is there was a process started towards um the beatification of Father Tommy and the the Irish Columbians. Is that correct? Yeah, there's eighty one modern day Korean martyrs. Yeah, and the the Dice of Seoul are sent, have put forward the eighty one names for beatification. There is. A lot of them were killed in the Korean War, but some were earlier, I think, as well. And it's a slow process because they have to investigate every single one of them. And um, last year, excuse me, Father Don O'Keefe said that it would take about 10 years, which didn't make me very happy mm. because um, I'd like to be around when it happens. Um, but then this year he said COVID slowing it up again so we could be instead of being at nine we could be still at ten but um, I asked him lately and that's what he said that they can't do field investigations um, so that we don't know but you know uh, you know what I think it's just for even for our, our viewers watching it's it's just something to even that whole process just to, to keep in the prayers but even from in from well, from anyone that's watching from other countries, from a Catholic point of view, but for particularly from an Irish point of view, like this story is outst outstanding. And I just encourage everyone that's watch watching just to pass it, share it and get this story known, because this like this is what this is what heroes are made of. But this is like dying for the faith, dying for the for the Eucharist, dying for for love of neighbor. This is what these men did in the in the most appalling and you know of situations and conditions and yet you know despite the, all the circumstances surrounding the death they went 
from what I can gather and from what I'm reading and listening to, they still went to their death uh, at peace because they were, you know, they were in good, they knew that they were in good standing with God um, and they knew what was to come after death. And this has been an absolutely outstanding story. So even like, I, I just encourage everyone to, to, to look them up there's actually um a website Do you want to call out the website um stephanie and i'll i'll display it here in the screen and, and also be in the description box below for anyone else who, who want to go and visit it okay it's www.koreanmartyrs.com excellent yeah. excellent and i've been on i was on that website when you sent it to me a few weeks ago and and as well as the um, as well as all the documents you'd, you'd sent. And it's absolutely outstanding. I was I was here at nighttime uh, at home when the kids went to bed and, and, and reading it and, you know, just 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 saying to my wife, like, this is this is what we need to hear in, in Ireland today. Just this desire, this love for the faith. And like just so many stories of this, um, of these kind of stories from all around the world. And there's so many been so many fantastic stories, even of of priests who've come before us, even who stayed in Ireland, within Ireland. But um, this particular story for me, it was, it just, it was really, really uh, touching and uh, really inspiring from a Catholic point of view, absolutely um, just out of this world, really. So listen, I, I, we're going to leave it there, but Stephanie, I want to really thank you for your, uh, for your time, giving of your time um, to, to speak here, because it's fantastic to speak to like, uh, to a niece of, of please God, uh, 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 who, who's probably now a saint, will hopefully be recognised in the uh, in the future by the by, by the church officially. Um, so thank you so much because I know I know we were we've been back and forth and I, and I've been hoping to do this interview uh, sooner, but I kept putting it back and uh, uh, and that. So no, I really appreciate you giving your time because you, you spoke fantastically and uh, really appreciate that. I appreciate the chance to do it because except they get and you know people pray for them it's not it's never going to happen yeah. and in the diocese of soul they say the prayer for the for the Columban martyrs every sunday and i would love if it could be said here and i've tried but not succeeded in and what we'll do is um to anyone that, that that's looking in the description box below i'll i'll paste that uh that prayer so that um and look please say it and spread it and pass it to your family and friends and people in your parish and you know we'll we'll just get that prayer out there um and, and get pe get people to say it so listen stephanie thanks a million thank you brian thank you no. i appreciate it a lot thank you thank you